Hello there. Welcome to Just the Discs. We talk about Blu-rays and 4Ks here. My name's Brian, and today I am wearing a shirt uh, that represents one of my favorite directors. His name is Howard Hawks. He was uh, a director during the classical Hollywood period, uh, and then, um, you know, did a few more things late into the 60s and early 70s was his last film, but I discovered him because of a film class I took in college, and I can't unfortunately remember the name of the professor, and I can't remember the name of the class, uh, but it was one where we were talking about, we had a section anyway on westerns, and I had seen westerns at the time, of course I knew spaghetti westerns, but I didn't know John Wayne westerns, and my professor... Uh, at the time, she had a real thing for both John Wayne and Howard Hawks and John Ford. So she screened The Searchers, Red River. Um, I feel like there was at least one more before this, but then also Rio Bravo, which we'll talk about in a second, which is one of my favorite films of all time. And at the time, I finally figured out like why... John Wayne was a star like it, seeing those movies so close together I was like okay I get it but it also really made me love Hawks and my professor talked all about his uh, you know sort of specific professionalism thematics that he brought into the, a lot of his films like they were about professionals doing a job of some kind and uh, the difference between professionals and amateurs, and that just is a running theme for him in a lot of his films. And I was really drawn to that, and so it really took off as a, you know, an interest for me, and got me. I mean, I was already interested in classic film, but between that and some of the other things, uh, to have and have not, we probably watched maybe. I can't remember. I watched that because of this class, um, but then Hawks you know, since has been one of my favorite directors. And so this month we got a nice little interesting upgrade for two of his films. One is, you know, one of my favorite films of all time. And the other is a lesser effort from him and one that was a rare commercial failure, but I think is a really still interesting movie. And we'll start with that because it leads into the other film, which I think is interesting. So we get... A Blu-ray upgrade for Land of the Pharaohs from 1955. And this film was, you know, one of the things I love about Hawks is that he worked in all kinds of different genres. You know, he was the kind of guy who did um, dramas, detective films, adventure films, war films, comedies. He did a lot of great comedies and westerns. And this is sort of his... Um, big spectacle epic kind of movie, you know. Um, Cecil B. DeMille would do these probably the best of any director, you know, King of Kings and, and films of that ilk, uh, The Ten Commandments. You know, he was really successful with these. This one just didn't quite work out. And the, it's interesting, I think, for me, why Hawks did it and what he was focused on. Um but let me just give a little background. So prior to this, in 1952 and 53, he'd made a couple comedies, uh, Monkey Business and Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. So I think those are successful comedies. And then he takes this one on. And again, it's probably one of the more expensive films he ever made. And I think they had, you know, close to 10,000 extras on some of the, anywhere from three to 10,000 extras working on a given day. Uh, and I guess they um, had the soldiers uh, from the Egyptian army involved. And, you know, it was just one of those things where he thought he would be remembered for this one, I think. But his focus really is on the pyramids. And the idea basically is that, you know, and the other thing that's tricky is this one doesn't really have a star in the way that a lot of his other films hang themselves on a star. Uh, it has Joan Collins and it has Jack Hawkins. Um, who are both uh, British actors. And Jack Hawkins plays this pharaoh, and he uh, is obsessed with 
getting treasure and getting uh, a pyramid built for his tomb because uh, the, this particular group really believes in second life, their life after this life on earth. And they want to have all their riches with them for this second life. So he captures all this treasure and he comes back and he he's able to capture some folks that, specifically one engineer architect guy that he wants to design his tomb because he saw what this guy had done in terms of designing uh, some some sort of like they were like things that they were using for battle, um, like a specific area that was looked like an open passage corridor way. And, and suddenly the ground rose up and all this stuff. And so they're like, I, he's like, I want that guy to design my tomb. Cause it, all these other tombs are getting their jewels stolen from. I just stole from a tomb. So he gets uh, a bunch of guys to design tombs and they give him crap that he doesn't like. And so he gets this guy and he's like, I need you to design something that can't be broken into. And the guy's like, well, let me think on it. And he's like, if you do it, I'll let you and all your people go. Because he's captured this guy's, you know, um, people as part of, part of a war effort. And so the guy decides to do it. He's got a son with him that's helping him. And so the movie really just focuses on the building of that pyramid. And the sort of traps within the tomb that this guy designs, which are really ingenious. And they use sand and it's this big slabs of stone um and then the other part of the drama is that he finds uh joan collins and that's through um he's asking a bunch of his auxiliary kingdoms to give food for the men that are building the pyramid and she comes in lieu of a donation she's the princess of her area and she is like very sassy and like basically like you can have me or you can have the food, but you can't have both. And he's like, you don't talk to me that way. And she's like, you have to choose. And so he ends up taking her as a second wife and she's really ends up being very conniving and wants his treasure. And so goes about, you know, disposing of the queen and maybe his son so that she can be the sole heir and maybe go, you know, then of course going after him so that she is the queen. So that's sort of the machinations of the plot really um but this is a big widescreen uh warner color movie and it looks very nice in this transfer i gotta say and um it is the only time i believe he worked in cinemascope widescreen uh there's a great commentary on this disc which is ported over from the dvd which is with peter bogdanovich and it includes excerpts from conversation maybe one or two conversations at least that he's had with hawks that he recorded so every once in a while, he'll intercut those clips of the Hawks conversation. The only downside to that, just as an aside, is that you can't watch it with the the Blu-ray version, the HD version. It's only available on an SD version that's also included here. For some reason, the lengths don't line up or something. I don't know why, but you can't. They didn't. They don't allow you to have that track play under the HD version. It's kind of annoying. So you have to watch a crappy SD non four by th- non uh, uh, 16 by nine enhanced version um, to get that commentary. But anyway, the movie looks really nice and the commentary is great and the excerpts from Hawks are great. And you find out that he's really more focused on the building of the pyramid, which is a thing that we don't to this day really know how it was done. And so he sort of, you know, has an idea of what he did, what was done um, and by the way, he got William Faulkner to write this, uh, which I think is great. I mean, there's a couple guys, a couple that are assisting getting it into a screenplay format, but Faulkner wrote it. Uh, but the problem is, and the reason it's kind of a camp classic is because Hawk him, Hawks himself admits, like he doesn't know what a pharaoh talks like. So they sound relatively modern in the way they speak to each other. They all obviously speak in English and, and it doesn't really make sense, you know, as a, a the pharaohs would speak this way and whatever um so it's kind of goofy in that way uh and hawks himself is like not proud of the film he's distanced himself from it and it didn't it was a commercial failure and uh he took four years off after doing it um of course he would come back and make you know real bravo which is one of his best movies it's sort of him going back to basics the idea that people are more interested in character than they are in spectacle and plot and stuff like that. And, and so I love the idea that 
it's a failure, but what he takes from it is that he learns that he's going to go back and do what he does best and makes, to me, his greatest film ever uh, on the heels of this. And I think that's one thing that a great director can do is learn something from a failure like this, dust themselves off and come back and just destroy. And so anyway, I'm very glad this is available on Blu-ray. Uh, I'm a, Like I said, I'm a big Hawks fan, so I was really kind of excited to revisit it. And I do like the film, despite its weirdness in terms of not really making sense in terms of how the pharaohs act and all this and the plot being whatever it's still a good movie and and the idea that he's so focused on the machinations of the traps and the labyrinths and the pyramid stuff and so there's that just the two aspects of it that i think make it a kind of an enjoyable fun watch and it's got a good ending uh if you once you watch the ending the ending will stick with you even if the rest of it is less memorable for you but a great upgrade from warner arcraft our Warner Archive for Land of the Pharaohs. And then, of course, we get Rio Bravo on 4K. Now, Rio Bravo, 1959. What a movie, man. Uh, a movie that I discovered, like I said, a lot of confluencing things happening in my college years. I was seeing this movie around this time in a class, and it knocked me out to see it presented. And that was one of the most enjoyable things, was to see something in a class where I was like, I love this and the film classes. I think this is where I really found my footing as a film person. Like I was like, Oh, this is an academic pursuit. Like, you know, this is something I can study. And I was just getting into it at the time. I mean, I already was studying it in a way and I was discovering Danny Perry at the same time. And then of course, this is one of Tarantino's favorite movies. And I was seeing lists of his favorite films and him saying how much this film meant to him. And so this really came along at the perfect moment in my life, but has continued to be one of the great films for me. And it is a quintessential hangout movie. You come back to this movie to hang out with these characters. You have John Wayne as Sheriff John T. Chance. You have uh, Dean Martin as Dude. And you have Ricky Nelson as Colorado. You have Angie Dickinson as Feathers. And the idea is basically that The movie opens incredibly with this wordless sequence where Dean Martin sneaks into a, you know, a uh, saloon and he's not looking real good and he sees Claude Akins at the bar. Claude Akins is, um, uh, which, Joe Burdett. Nathan Burdett is his brother. Uh, And he's getting a drink and he sees Dean Martin and he holds the drink up like, hey, do you want this? Without saying anything. Dean Martin's like, oh, yeah, you know, again, not speaking. And he pulls a gold or a dollar uh, coin out of his uh, pocket and throws it into the spittoon across the bar, which is obviously going to be disgusting. And Dean Martin looks down and looks back at the guy and looks down and is about to go in and dig into that grossness of this, you know, spittoon to get that dollar out so he can buy a drink. And as he reaches in, suddenly a foot comes into frame and kicks the spittoon out of the way and that's John Wayne and he looks down at Martin he shakes his head like I'm just very disappointed in you and he goes over to uh, he's about to go over to Joe Burdett but Dean Martin stands up and punches him out because he's insulted and at that moment um, a fight breaks out and he because he goes after Joe Burdett Joe beats him up and a guy tries to stop him from hitting Dean Martin. He turns around and shoots the guy point blank in the stomach with his gun. This is Joe Burdett. Kills the guy. Unarmed guy. Didn't have a gun on him. So here is the inciting incident. A murder is committed in cold blood. And Joe Burdett walks out of the bar to another bar. And uh, everyone else is stunned that he's just killed this guy over trying to stop him from hitting Dean Martin. Uh, so he walks and still no dialogue is spoken, walks into another bar, waves at the bartender, gets another drink and in comes J- John T. Chance with his head all bleeding from getting smacked by Dean Martin. And he, uh, basically ends up arresting Joe Burdett for the murder and drags him off to his jail. Now, Joe Burdett is a rich man. His brother is an even richer man, played his n- brother's Nathan Burdett. 
And the idea is that they must hold Joe in the jail for a little while, like a week, because it's, it's going to take that long for the marshal from the next county or whatever to come and pick him up and take him to trial to, to the real jail for this murder. In the meantime, Nathan Burnett has hired a bunch of killers uh, and uh, hired guns to bottle up the town and to make their attempts to get into the jail and get Joe out. And so the other part of this equation is Stumpy, and he's played wonderfully uh, by, of course, um, Walter Brennan. Um, and he's a handicapped man, old man, uh, but he's watching the jail. And so it just becomes like hanging out with these guys waiting for the, the, this Joe Burdett to get picked up while still keeping an eye on the town and keeping an eye on the people in the town, like Ward Bond, who showed up with, um, Colorado, Ricky Martin, who initially does not want to get involved in this whole arrangement, uh, but eventually does, and they become this like unstoppable team. Uh, but it is just a wonderful movie, and I just love the the interactions between the characters, the redemptive nature of Dean Martin's storyline. Uh, I like Ricky Martin, Ricky Nelson in this, um, and there's even you know the signature Hawks musical number, which he was able to work into a lot of films, and which sounds like it would be lame, but in the context and the way that he does it, it's just delightful. You know, they're just sitting around the jail waiting one night and Ricky Nelson break, breaks out the guitar and starts singing and then they're all singing and you're like, how does this work? How can this be so good? But it is. Um, and it is in a highly influential film. Uh, one of the things you get on this 4K, which looks very good, by the way. I was very impressed with the color in this. This is a, um, I want to say this is a Technicolor film. Yeah. Beautiful score by Dimitri Tiomkin, who also did the score for Land of the Pharaohs. Uh, and it looks good. You know, the grain is still there in a good way, and the color is bright, and it just... I was very happy to see, literally, this is in my top three favorite films of all time. That's how good, I think, for me, this is. And it looks wonderful. And I was really happy with this 4K. This is one of my most exciting... This and After Hours 4K, which I have coming soon... Two of my favorite films, literally, of all time, getting these 4K releases this year, and I couldn't be happier about it. And this turned out really well. So anyway, uh, speaking of the influence of this film, there's a commentary by John Carpenter and Richard Schickel on here. And if you listen to John Carpenter, he's a huge Howard Hawks fan. Um, going back to his production of The Thing, which obviously would influence Carpenter making his version of The Thing. Without Hawks, there is no Thing, you know? Uh, but there's also no Assault on Precinct 13, which is very much a updated version of this kind of idea, you know, updated to a Los Angeles, you know, abandoned police station with an, a prisoner inside that's being sought by gang members. He, he did a really interesting job of updating it, but he loves Rio Bravo. And so it's really neat to hear his commentary on this. Although Carpenter has a tendency sometimes to do the actual commentary, which is the thing of telling you what's happening on screen. But he also does bring out some cool things about why he loves this movie, why he loves Hawks, and it's good to have Schickel in there to bounce off. So um, two nice commentaries on both of these discs, which I was really excited about. But yeah, Rio Bravo to me, one of the great Westerns of all time, and it doesn't do it through the use of you know John Ford-esque vistas as much as it's this little, little small Western town set or whatever, and the characters and what they're going through and what Dean Martin's history is uh, with John T. Chance's character, with w the Wayne character. And it's it's just a wonderful, wonderful film. And it has a really exciting conclusion with one of the great lines ever of let's make a little noise, Colorado. You know, one that just always has stuck with me. But yeah, so anyway, highly recommended. If you haven't seen it, um, you know, maybe you don't need the 4K of it, but you should watch it because I do think it's one of the great Westerns and one of the great character pieces of the 1950s. Um, and I love it. And so really excited to see Hawks getting the high definition treatment, one, two punch of one of his lesser films and one of his greatest films and to have them come out so close together and to think about the way that they connect, which I think is really interesting. It's something I hadn't thought of until... I started looking at them and listening to that Bogdanovich commentary, which is great, and just thinking about, wow, so this is the one that is a low point for him, 
and he follows it with an absolute high point. I just it makes me respect him that much more as as a filmmaker. And yeah, so um big love for Howard Hawks and big love for uh both these Warner Brothers related releases. I hope we get some more uh, HD treatment for Hawks in the future. We still don't have a Blu-ray for uh, some of his comedies. We don't have, I don't think um, I don't think Monkey Business has one. Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, maybe, but I don't think so. Um, Ball of Fire, one of my favorites, does not have one. That's with um, Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck. So he's got a lot of movies left to get the HD treatment. I love to see Hatari get a 4K. That got a nice or decent Blu-ray from Paramount years ago. But I could always use more Hawks in my life, and his catalog is quite vast. And there are some Blu-rays that have come out. You know, there's some nice Blu-rays from Indicator of his comedy uh, 20th Century, uh, which with um, uh, Barrymore and uh, Carol Lombard. And his really great prison drama, The Criminal Code, with Boris Karloff, uh, that's got a nice Blu-ray from Indicator as well. So I just want more of that. Give me more Hawks on Blu-ray, please. You know, anything that he hasn't, you know, put out already. I mean, okay, so like uh, Man's Favorite Sport came out on Blu-ray recently again. That's nice. But... And Redline 7000, you know, Kino's definitely gotten some of his latter era stuff. I don't think that stuff is as good, but let's get uh, Ceiling Zero, you know, which is kind of like Only Angels Have Wings. Thankfully, that has a Blu-ray, one of my favorites of his. Um, The Crowd Roars with Jimmy Cagney. That's got on a Warner Archive DVD. That doesn't have a Blu-ray yet. Uh, There's just a lot of Hawks that I'd love to see on Blu-ray, not to go on and on about this, but... I'd love to see it and give me more and I'm first in line to pick it up. And I hope uh, any of the Hawks fans out there that lo- like this channel are as excited as I am about these two releases and looking forward to more hopefully in the future. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.